Good morning, everyone. So welcome to this uh, session on uh, econometrics in the 21st century. Uh, it's organized by the Journal of Econometrics. So let me just make a few remarks and now uh, we can get this uh, panel discussion started. So as I said, this is uh, organized by the Journal of Econometrics, which has been um, the top field journal uh, in publishing papers in econometric theory and methods. And uh, me and my editorial team, uh, consisting of Eli Tamer here, Xiao Hong Chen, and Torben Anderson sitting over there. Uh, we started our term last year. And uh, in addition to maintaining tradition of publishing quality papers, we started a, new, a few new in initiatives. Uh, we started to promote publication of a collection of papers around a theme. So if you're interested in it, um, please check out our website. Uh, to encourage um, better use of econometric theory and integration of econometric theory and methods, we invited contributions to how-to papers, how to do uh, synthetic controls, for example. And um, papers are getting longer and longer. So um, we started putting page limits. Uh, we avoid over-refereeing. And um, we target for a six-month turnaround, uh, basically to streamline the publication process. So we just finished our first year of our term and has been a learning experience, but it has been uh, moving pretty slowly, sm smoothly. So, so <laughs> slowly, but smoothly. Right. So, so, so why, why are we here? Um, so there's a sense among us that um, econometrics is at a crossroad. So if I look up Wikipedia, Wikipedia, it describes econometrics as the application of statistical methods to economic data to give economic empirical content to economic relations. So for a long time, up, un, up until perhaps the last 10, 15 years or so, whether you work for the government, for the private sector, or you do empirical work, when you use economic data, it's almost understood you're using some statistical methods, econometric methods. But this has been changing. We have new data coming from different sources, and we need new ways to extract those relationships. The data are no longer conventional. Um, and uh, we now have algorithmic methods with no statistical underpinnings that can do work that is similar but not exactly what we used to do. But yet, with all these developments, there is a um, more opportunity for us uh, to find links between economic theory and data. So the question that we were thinking about is where do we go from here, both for research and for teaching? And uh, for the journal, what, what role should we play? And this led us uh, to this um, panel discussion. We are extremely delighted to have um, a distinguished panel of econometricians that really need no introduction. Um, this includes uh, Gary Chamberlain, Angus Deaton, Lars Hansen, Guido Imbens, Rosa Maskin, Dan McFadden, and Chris Sims. And frankly, when I started inviting these people, I was only expecting two. Uh, to agree, and I was shocked that everybody I invited agreed, so I concluded there must be something worthy of discussion. And um, so the format we're going to follow uh, today is each speaker will, will go alphabetically, uh, talk for 10 minutes, some will use slides, some won't, um, and they choose to sit down there because they want to be able to see the slides. Um, and after that, there will be Q&A just among the, the panelists, um, up to three minutes each, and then we're going to open up uh, to the floor, and uh, we welcome everybody's um, input. And uh, um, the highlights of the session will be up, will appear in the forthcoming issue of the Journal of Econometrics. So, uh, without further delay, I'm going to start with the first speaker um, alphabetically, and this is going to be Gary Chamberlain. I'm going to focus on uh, decision problems. <clears throat> uh, Campbell and Vicera uh, have, have a quote from Keynes, argues that uh, economists should be more like dentists. Uh, their response, well, dentists give advice, and economists can try to provide advice 
uh, to improve economic decisions that uh, individuals are asked to make. Now, their monograph was on portfolio choice, but quite broad, uh, involved consumption savings decisions, life cycle, and one could add other uh, decisions, human capital investment, health, treatment choice. Uh, I'll focus on the uh, on portfolio choice. I use a paper by uh, Nick Barbaris. So an investor at some point uh, looks back, uh, has data, uh, choosing between two assets, uh, start with a buy and hold case, uh, focuses on end of horizon wealth, uh, so at T plus T hat. So we have these future accumulated returns in logs uh, to deal with. Um, framework, you need a framework to, uh, I think, uh, to, to do decision problems. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, use subjective expected utility. So a key, uh, predictive distribution. Well, that comes from specifying a Markov process. Uh, here it's a vector autoregression. Uh, it has parameters. There's a prior distribution over those parameters. And uh, integrate over the prior. And yes, you get your predictive for these cumulative future returns. Now here, I have it all conditional on data up until uh, cap T. Uh, an alternative would be go back to time zero and think about a plan, form a plan to how to choose that allocation once the data is available. That ex ante approach, you get the same answer. So there's a uh, dynamic consistency here. And when we look at other approaches, we'll ask about dynamic consistency. So what are concerns here? Uh, well, way back, uh, Ramsey wrote, uh, I didn't work out the logic uh, in detail. That's like working out to seven decimals, a uh, result valid to two. Uh, so yes, specifying a precise predictive distribution, uh, it's tough. Uh, now, one reaction has come from, uh, from Lars Hansen and, 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 and Sargent uh, uh, using robust control theory. We take a reference model well, that would be this barbarous predictive distribution. We set up a neighborhood. We look at the minimum of expected utility over that neighborhood, and then we maximize. There's a maxi min. Uh, this relates to ambiguity in decision theory, and I want to look at some of the work there. One version, uh, variational preferences. So F, F is an act for any state it'll give you an outcome, or here, it gives you an objective lottery over outcomes. Because this is the anscombe Almond setup, where an objective roulette lottery is distinguished from a subjective uh, horse lottery. There's a Neumann Morgenstern utility function that values these lotteries, and there's a cost function, C. Very important special case. Uh, if this cost function is zero for some set of distributions, and then infinite otherwise, that's the gilboa schmeidler multiple priors case. We'll take that set of distributions, look at minimum expected utility over the set, and then maximize, so max min. What about dynamic consistency? Well, think about conditional preference. So some event, E, it's known to have occurred. We'd like to compare acts, F and G, conditional on that event. Well, if you are willing to specify the counterfactual, what happens off the event, things are straightforward. You think about an act where if S, the state is in E, you get F. Otherwise, you get this counterfactual H. Well, to compare F and G conditional on E, you just use the unconditional preferences. You just set up F if E, counterfactual H otherwise, G if E, counterfactual H otherwise, and you can just use the original preferences. So here, dynamic consistency is built in. 
the issue is, does that counterfactual H matter? If not, that's consequentialism. Conditional preferences don't depend on that counterfactual H. This would be equivalent to Savage's sure thing principle. Say we impose consequentialism. My colleague, Tomas Strzelecki, he showed that then the preferences have this form called multiplier preferences, uh, much used by Hansen and Sargent, where that cost function is based on relative entropy. It compares this distribution P to our reference Q. There's one free parameter, kappa, positive, the multiplier parameter. Related would be constraint preferences, where you set up a neighborhood of the reference a relative entropy neighborhood, now one free parameter, eta, it governs the size of the neighborhood. How do you choose these free parameters? Well, you don't have to choose one. How do you choose the free parameter? Well, think about a least favorable distribution. So you reverse max and min. For a given p, you max, over a, max f over some feasible set, and then min over p that P star is the least favorable uh, prior. Way back, uh, I.J. Good argued uh, a minimax, or for us, max min uh, solution, uh, it's reasonable if and only if this least favorable P star is reasonable according to your beliefs. I think that's a good way to think about the choice uh, of the free parameter. These multiplier preferences have two very nice properties. They're recursive and they satisfy probabilistic sophistication. Okay, here I'm looking at uh, Barbaros with rebalancing the portfolio in every date. There's also a consumption savings decision. The point is there's a value function. There's a value function recursion. To get it, you take that value t plus one, the continuation value, you apply a certain function to it. It's this negative exponential uh, zeta function. Uh, it's indexed by that multiplier parameter kappa. If kappa went to infinity, this would be a linear function. And then you would have expected utility, the, the standard uh, value function recursion. Uh, of course, here you do not. Uh, what you actually, well, what you actually have, well, come back. I uh, want to stress this probabilistic sophistication. Given Q, uh, if two acts produce the same distribution under Q over outcomes, you're going to treat them as indifferent. There's a single distribution, Q, the reference distribution, that codifies your probabilistic beliefs. There's a separation of beliefs from preferences. And uh, the preferences here, of course, they're not expected utility. They're Krupp's Porteous. There are other neighborhoods that uh, can work, don't have time, but uh, fee divergence neighborhoods can also have these two special properties. Critique. Well, um, uh, Chris Sims uh, in writing about pitfalls of maxi min, uh, he stressed two things. Violates the sure thing principle. Well, but special cases, like these multiplier preferences, uh, satisfy the sure thing principle. A second objection, well, if you don't have a single set of probabilistic beliefs, there can be a Dutch book. Well, how would that happen? If you use the least favorable prior as your belief, that, de that depends on the feasible set of actions. That's going to change. And yes, Dutch book. If you focus on the reference distribution Q, that's a probabilistic sophistication. There's just one distribution there, no Dutch book. But you don't have expected utility preferences. You have Krebs Porteous preferences. Uh, summarize choose those, choose a neighborhood. So the least favorable distribution is reasonable. Ambiguity preferences can certainly provide a sensitivity analysis for subjective expected utility. 
uh, focus on decision problems. I think that's the fruitful path for econometrics. Uh, computations can be horrendous, but uh, few shortcuts if needed. Thank you. The next speaker is Angus Deaton. much. It's a great pleasure to be here and um, address this enormous audience. Um, I, this is a huge challenge for me. I never thought of myself as an econometrician, though Serena very kindly described me as one um, or included me. I once was a professor of econometrics, though I got promoted out of that. And <laughs> I'm going to talk about what might be more loosely described as sociology and history. Um, I am a user, however. Uh, I care about tools, and I care a lot about data, um, but more about discovering how things work. So I read and observe and sometimes worry about what I see, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so just to go a long way back, um, you know, most of you were not born at that point, but there was a time in the 1960s and early 70s, particularly in Britain, Australia, and Netherlands, where econometrics were in separate departments. That turned out to be a really, really, really bad idea. It was probably good for getting jobs because uh, academic administrators tend to give one position, one position, one position to each department, but it was a disaster for the profession. When I first came in in the early 70s, what seemed to be uh, going on was simultaneous equation estimator. And I remember going to sessions in world congresses where there was session after session after session on K-class estimators. Um, you guys are nodding. You actually know what a K-class estimator is. It has to be still in some textbook um, somewhere. Um, in the 80s, um, which is when I got more excited about the subject, I think, and this parallels what happened at the very beginning. Um, there was a much closer, if perhaps temporary, um, movement of bringing economics and econometrics closer together. And I wanted to talk about that because it is a data revolution of its own kind. And I think that's around the time when economists had access to micro data on a large scale, which prior to that they had not. I think the first paper I wrote had 19 observations. Um, my friend Hank Barber is very pleased to tell you that in his PhD thesis he had 29 observations and I think maybe 343 parameters. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Hank's here. He'll get me for that afterwards. Um, so, you know, if you were working with aggregate time series, you really did have very few observations once upon a time. And we used a lot of theory and having a lot of data suddenly liberated us. And of course, like all liberations, when you break out of the cage, you sometimes wish you were back in the cage um, because there's a lot of stuff to handle that's new and different. Um, but I remember in the early 80s, you went to the econometric seminar at Princeton, and it was jammed with applied people um, more than econometricians. And that seems to be not so much the case anymore. And I worry that a lot of applied people see econometrics as sort of irrelevant um, to what they do. And I think that's a mistake, too. So it's clear that AI and machine learning and all the things that Serena knows about can help see new and surprising patterns. I think of those as building stylized facts. Um, stylized facts are something that I find very interesting, um, especially when they throw out puzzles. Um, so, you know, a good cross-tabulation, a good stylized fact, a good pattern can make causal statements because you can suddenly realize that the way you'd always thought about something, the mechanism that produced that something, cannot be valid. 
so you can get a refutation of a supposed causal mechanism from a cross tabulation or from new data. Um, this ought to be obvious, but people think it's impossible to make causal statements with observational data, and that seems to me a very good example. It's also clear that several studies, <coughs> to take an example of a big data revolution, is um, Jack Lew's release of um, the tax data, the de-identified individual tax data. So we suddenly got 50 billion, or I don't know how many, it's not billions, but it's very large numbers of data points. And that really has, I think, revolutionized our understanding of the way taxes work, of what is inequality. It's brought a whole new generation of young economists interested in national income accounting, for example. I think of behavioral economics as some extent the reaction to the availability of microdata and the greater power of large samples, which meant the sort of simple theory we'd been using to buttress our lack of observations didn't work very well. And one response to that was to move into the sort of behavior. There are, however, serious ethical issues, which I'm not sure we fully dealt with. Many of these large data sets are proprietary, so it's not possible to make them publicly available. Um, that raises all sorts of replication issues. Rep what are called replication data sets are helpful, but not very helpful, um, because they exclude all of the preliminary work that's been done um, before you get to that stage. Um, experimenting on people without their knowledge and permission seems to me wrong, and in many cases actually illegal. Um, many of us are being experimented on on a daily basis without our knowledge because we signed a document online which gave Google or Amazon or Uber permission to experiment on us. And it's on page 73 of a 143 page document. That is not informed consent. And I think there's gonna be a reckoning associated with that at some point. Um, there's a question as to whether we have an essential core which needs to be taught. And I'm not entirely sure about that. But here are some of my candidates um, that simultaneity and equilibrium, equilibrium is the sort of central concept in economics. And the Coles Commission very early on um, wrestled with that and developed techniques which could handle that. I think that's a unique contribution, econometric. It's gone out of fashion because people don't think about equilibrium very much anymore, or applied people do so less. Um, the ideas of identification and selection are much deeper, deeply ingrained in economics than they are in many other subjects. Um, it's clear, and I suppose, you know, a standard metric sequence used to have two courses, one which was mathematical statistics and one of which was econometrics. It seems to me that um, the first of these is absolutely essential. Um, and it's, some of it seems to be being lost. Um, I worry a lot when I see applied work, and maybe I see the wrong end of applied work or something, but I see many, many papers where people don't know the difference between bias and precision. Um, the word bias has come to mean all sorts of things other than bias, um, and is used as a general term of approbation. Um, Danny Kahneman's writing a book about that. I worry that we have not reached a professional consensus on what, how we should use the term causality and what it means. You know, for many years, economists and econometrics studiously avoided um, use of the term causality. I mean, you will not find it in the index of many major textbooks. That's not only true in economics, it's true in many scientific subjects too. And it's partly because um, there's a scare around it, simply because philosophers have been worrying about it for about 5,000 years. And there's a feeling that unless you know that literature, um, you don't know what you're talking about. Some truth to that. But one of the things that bothers me is this belief that I come across every day, and I believe it's false, um, that causality is a property of data that can be inferred from using suitable methods on the data. Um, Frisch, and more recently Jim Heckman, um, used the phrase, causality is in the mind, um, it's not in the data. Um, I found this statement recently, um, written by 
philosopher and a person I regard as the very best of the um, epidemiologists, that causal conclusions do not follow deductively from data without a strong set of auxiliary assumptions. And these assumptions are themselves not deductive consequences of the data. We suggest that it's good practice to refrain from calling any individual studies estimate causal, even if it's a randomized trial. It is the totality of the evidence that leads to the verdict of causality. Causality is a scientific conclusion, a theoretical claim, and as such transcends any individual study. I think our students ought to be able to, ought to be made to read that. <laughs> what that tells you, which is very different from current practice, is that the, inf the identification wars will never go away because there's always a way of challenging. You have to make an assumption somewhere, an untestable assumption somewhere, um, in order to infer the causal conclusion. So RCTs don't take you away from the world of instrumental variables, for instance, or the endless identification wars that revolve around instrumental variables. Um, I worry, too, that what, what sort of causality are we talking about here? Um, you know, causality in terms of an average treatment effect is not the way most people think about causality. I mean, what an RCT tells you is that the effect was caused, the treatment was causally effective for at least one person in the sample. It doesn't tell you anything about the other people in the sample. And that violates a lot of the ways we think about causality. People think that you can get around this by replication. Um, Serena's going to pull the plug on me in a minute. But <laughs> let me bring up my favorite chicken, um, which appears in Bertrand Russell's um, wrote about it in, in uh, 1912. Bertrand Russell had a chicken, um, and the chicken learned from hundreds of replications that when she heard the farmer's footsteps coming in the morning, she was going to get fed. And so eventually she inferred that footsteps meant feeding until on Christmas Eve when he wrung her neck. Um, Bertrand Russell comments rather tartly at the end of this illustration, more refined views as to the uniformity of nature would have been useful to the chicken. They would also be useful to economists who seem to have bypassed theory and replaced causality by it. And, you know, there's lots of other things. We don't teach Inus causality, for instance. I love to reel this out. An insufficient but non-redundant part of a condition which is itself unnecessary but sufficient for the occurrence of the effect. I think most causality is like that, um, which is you leave your television on and that burns down your house, right? And that's because someone left a lot of tinder lying around by the plug, and so the presence of the television being turned on um, did, you could do a randomized control trial and houses with the TV turned on would burn down more often than those without the turn, turned on. But it tells you nothing useful at all about what you really want to know. And so a lot of the causality that people are putting in the titles of their papers um, seem to me to reflect things like that or don't exactly rule them out. Now, you know, you could go to Judea Pearl, if you like, who is a completely worked out system of how to run this thing. I can hear um, Ido snorting in the background. Um, he and Judy are, are good friends and have had many memorable encounters. Um, I am actually a very good friend of Judy's and I like him a lot, but I don't buy his system at all. I mean, his system I don't think works for economists um, at all. But I don't think economists have put in the effort to think about causality in that way. I had a slide on when and when not to randomize. I'll skip that. But I want to have a, just a final thought on experiments. Um, one of the things that drives me nuts is people making comparisons, favorable comparisons towards medicine. So here's a recent one. I won't tell you who the authors are. Research standards imply, inspired by clinical trials in medicine where rigorous research protocols ensure reliability reproducibility, accountability, transparency, and social responsibility. 
Well, you know, OxyContin was approved by the FDA based on an RCT. It's killed around 200,000 Americans so far. The RCT didn't stop those people dying. Um, the FDA, what actually I would attribute in technical economic terms is this is a failure of SUDPA. That what happened was you pumped out these pills without considering the fact that there would be spillovers and that many other people would get them um, and would die and you would trigger an epidemic. The FDA by law is required to impose SUDVA, essentially. It cannot consider any effects of drugs other than the effects of the drugs on the people themselves. And that's a terrible mistake. But it's also terrible that if you look at the details of that RCT, that RCT was designed by the pharma company in order to get the result that it wanted to get. And so that doesn't really give you any protection. So one thing I do think we ought to do is that I've been in the explosion of stuff that's appeared um, after this year's Nobel Prize. The, the theme that's come up again and again that struck me most forcefully is issues about ethics. And, you know, we've, we've started making data available. We've started asking people to have pre-analysis plans. We're not checking at all on whether the people agreed to be in the experiments. And it's clear that in some of the experiments, there are huge power differences um, and finance differences between the experimenters on the one hand and the people who are being experimented on the other hand. The um, beneficence is the cardinal principle of human subjects. Beneficence is supposed to be for the subjects, um, not for the careers of the experimenters. And I'll leave you with that thought. It's an odd thought that econometricians ought to know about ethics. But, you know, if they're going to experiment on people, that's a really serious consideration. Thank you. The next, the next speaker is Lars Hansen. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this event. Um, I want to avoid the following. It's, I, I've been to, it's, uh, over the course of my career to too many sessions where a bunch of old people go and tell a bunch of young people what to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about some problems that interest me, uh, but, but don't view these as instructions about what you should be doing. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about three different things. One is I'll talk a little bit about the, the issue that um, Serena assigned to us, big data and data science. I want to talk about model misspecification sensitivity analyses that overlaps a little bit of what Gary talked about. And then I want to talk about economic decision makers themselves confronting uncertainty. Um, so this idea about empiricism and let the data speak and, and, and where models come into play has a long history. Um, uh, I was exploring this a little bit and then my colleague Steven Stigler decided to push, uh, sh sh showed me I could push it back much further at Alfred Marshall. There's kind of a long history of discussion, debate, contrasting empiricism with explicit modeling. And uh, as Marshall said, the most rec reckless and treacherous of all theorists is he who professes to let the facts and figures speak for themselves, who keeps in the background the part he has played, perhaps unconsciously, in selecting and grouping them. Of course, you have discussions like Koopman's measurement without theory and, and some interesting uh, counter arguments, uh, Marshak, Hurwitz, Lucas, and the like. Um, I wrote an essay for fun in uh, uh, about, I've, I've been hearing this term evidence-based policy around Chicago way too much and I just decided it was important to add that you can't really do purely evidence-based policy, that there has to be some substantive inputs to really get anywhere on it. So, um, so I just, you know, the, just remind you what, what we do in econometrics, I think that the important contribution is these so-called structural models and why do we do them? to interpret evidence, to study counterfactuals used for policy analyses, and offer transparency and clarity. They address questions like how do we extrapolate from places where data are rich to places where data are sparse, and, and, and what do we treat as invariant 
when he changed policies becomes a very, very important question and, and one that, you know, that we often treat rather cavalierly. But, but when we're talking about these data-rich environments like this, well, yes, the data is rich some places, and, 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 and often in econometrics we have to figure out how to take that richness and ex extrapolate it somewhere else. So to me, I see, you know, they, we've, we've visiting some challenges in the past, but, you know, with, 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 with kind of a new context. Yes, the new data access and efficient computational algorithms open the door to construction and assessment of new models. I think about macroeconomics when it uh, had national income and product accounts. It kind of dictated the type of models that were built. As new data comes aboard, which, uh, this, it may well lead to ex uh, interesting new models with economic structure to them. Um, but, but I think the niche of econometrics has to be in the imposition of the structure. Um, the data should inform, of course, the model construction, but the models are really critical interpretive devices for this extrapolation and counterfactuals. And then how do we ensure transparency in the construction and application of algorithms? I think it's very important. You know, do, do, you know, do we get, how do we avoid the black box syndrome and just get, uh, um, you know, we've done this massive you know, search through data sets and here's the answer. So transparency really opens the door to critical assessments and limits the, uh, to the misuse of data analytic methods. So for me in econometrics, I see opportunities for exciting research that goes well beyond just the accessing new data and applying new computational methods, but rather levers these and takes them um, uh, further. So in economic dynamics, we build models that are highly stylized. They're often calibrated. Um, and I view these as models that are to provide quantitative stories. They're highly stylized. Uh, the fact that they're misspecified is, is not, not much of an insight, uh, but they're built to facilitate understanding. And, 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 and their, um, you know, their views, if we make them highly complicated, it's going to be really hard to really understand the economic mechanisms very well. And so this idea, I, I, I view this as a very credible research strategy, this quantitative storytelling. It's, 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 it's actually uh, you know, pervasive in, in economic dynamics and policy analyses. Um, the question is, how do we really turn this into interesting statistical and econometric exercises. So I think that remains a very, a, a very fascinating challenge. Moreover, the thing is, you know, we often have different papers have their own multiple, their own quantitative stories. And the challenge that, that I think has been missing in a lot of work is how do we do the, uh, the comparisons, the model comparisons across these different multiple stories. So here I see some really interesting challenges. How do you really provide empirically guided inputs? Because you, know, that you, get, uh, you want some empirical inputs into these. To pose the analysis and assessment of these models as purely statistical testing problems against you know, null hypotheses and the standard way that we uh, um, sometimes engage in econometric practice seems misguided. Really, this is about model comparisons. And, 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 and what's a good model must have to do with how, uh, what, um, how you want to use the model. And for me, it becomes hard to escape this idea of trying to um, uh, pose some type of decision problem in terms, in terms of doing the model comparisons beyond the kind of mechanical stuff that we uh, often incorporate. And then once we engage in this, then how do we broadly incorporate into the, uh, these uncertainties? The fact that the models are, in some sense, simplifications, the fact that there's multiple models on the table um, uh, in, in, into social valuation. Often, Policymakers makers not very kind of facile in, 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 in statistics want to know just the simple answer. And, and, and that stretches uh, scientific credibility because that's, what, that's not often what we have to provide. And so what's the right way to uh, kind of bridge that gap and, and really be credible in terms of the type of inputs we provide. So I, I, I view this as a kind of a very interesting and fascinating challenge going forward. How do we kind of use these kind of, you know, highly stylized models in sensible ways with, uh, with, um, uh, with some empirical credibility. Um, so here I think sensitivity analyses become really important. Uh, and, and, uh, and, it, and as I say, to do these, I think you really need to have some type of decision problem in the background. The final topic that um, I think is uh, really interesting is we often think about these decision, we often think, of, when we teach econometrics, we think about the econometrician as, um, as given some model, he's supposed to go out and estimate, test it, and go out and assess it. But the idea of how we build the models is kind of off, is, is, is in some other class. Uh, but the models in economic dynamics, they have firms, people inside them, and they're making decisions, and, and, and they're having to cope with uncertainty and confront uncertainty. 
And so it seems to me like these same things that we're wrestling with in econometrics and statistics ought to perhaps have some insights as we do, do, do the actual model constructions. Um, so there's been lots of interest in so-called behavioral economics, and I, and I personally find these behavioral distortions to be far more compelling in environments for which the uncertainty itself is complex. If we put it, you know, individuals in a complicated environment, it becomes hard for them to, um, it would just become very challenging to kind of figure things out in the kind of simple, naive way we uh, uh, um, um, often assume in rational expectation settings. But it's still, you know, yes, tools of psychology are interesting, but I think also statistical tools can be very valuable here to, as well. They can provide ways to assess the complexity. They can provide ways to kind of maybe potentially bound the range of these behavioral responses. Um, and, and, uh, in the sense of, you know, there is still this intuition that naive people kind of you know, uh, get driven out of markets and stuff like this, but it, it's, it's, it's in complicated settings, this, this, you know, the, you know, that whole issue becomes far more uh, subtle. But, but I think there is a range, I think there's a rule there, there's an interesting rule there for using statistics and econometrics methods in the building of the models themselves and not just the, uh, uh, the, the econometricians given the model and you're supposed to go out and uh, do stuff with it. So I, 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 that's, a, that's a kind of a third type of connection I find very valuable. So in, anyway, these are problems that interest me. These are the, the um, I, I'm not, uh, um, of course everyone should work on what they feel is their own best uh, uh, exciting to them. Thank you. The next speaker is Guido Imben. Well, thanks to the organizers uh, for organizing this and uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to talk to, uh, here. And, um, Personally, I think this is a very exciting uh, time to be, to be doing econometrics. Uh, I agree with Serena that it's at the crossroads. There's lots of interesting challenges, uh, but there's lots of interesting uh, questions uh, for, for econometricians uh, uh, to work on. So I want to uh, sort of partly motivated by some of the questions uh, Serena and the organizers raised in uh, some earlier emails. I want to talk about three things. Uh, first, a little bit about the what I teach, sort of how that has changed over the, the last 25, 30 years. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what topics have become more prominent uh, in empirical work, uh, and then speculate a little bit of what, uh, what uh, may be important in the, in the future. But first, I want to echo what uh, Lars was saying uh, here. Don't necessarily do what I say. Don't necessarily do what the rest of the panel uh, says. Uh, and I may have views on uh, which particular panel members. Uh, but the, we, we, all of us were, were successful kind of by doing research that was interesting and novel at the time, but it, that, that's not necessarily, uh, those are not necessarily questions that are going to be important in the, in the future. And sort of I want to uh, echo the, the comments by Angus, kind of, but it's really important to kind of tie things to empirical work and kind of listen to the people doing empirical work uh, and it's, it's uh, disappointing if the econometric seminars uh, are no longer of interesting to the applied people and we're doing something uh, wrong there. I do, do also want to acknowledge that I actually I, uh, was taught in one of the econometric, the pure econometrics departments and I completely agree with Angus that that, that was ultimately a very bad uh, the way to set up the, the teaching, although it worked particularly well for people to get uh, basic uh, training uh, at the time. But so here, I, I kind of, the, a couple of weeks ago, I look, looked back at the syllabi for my co second year econometrics courses over the years, uh, and the dates on this are not all accurate because I couldn't really find all of them. But sort of what, what came out of that was sort of partly that things do change, uh, things do change kind of fairly rapidly and, uh, and smoothly. The, what I taught when I first started teaching kind of a, a general second year econometrics course is very different from what I uh, teach now. Lots of topics have moved out. Uh, sometimes they moved into first year courses, they became more central. Uh, lots of uh, things uh, came in. Early on, a lot of uh, things to do with causal inference uh, came in uh, 
more recently, a lot of machine learning uh, uh, methods have, uh, have come in. But it's very likely that, that in another 20 years, the, the, these courses will look very different uh, again, obviously even more than within the person. They would change when, uh, when new people started teaching uh, these courses. But clearly, econometrics is, has been changing rapidly and continues uh, to change rapidly. And, and this is a time when, when I think uh, lots of things, lots more things are going to change. And so one, one issue there is that, that I want to raise, that there's sort of some tension in, in designing econometrics courses uh, between needing to teach what, uh, what empirical researchers want to know and what we think they should, uh, they should know. And that um, we sort of have a role in the second part in, in deciding what, what things are important, uh, in, uh, even if, if people are not using uh, those things at the moment. But if we go too far there, uh, we're going to lose the audience. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of that has, that, to some extent, uh, that has been happening uh, over the years. Uh, and separating the, the econometrics community from the, the empirical community. And so we need to, to make sure we also teach what, uh, what empirical researchers actually want to, uh, to know. And that regard, that, uh, speaking to that, uh, there's sort of clearly at the moment at lots of universities a huge demand for, for uh, sort of mostly harmless type uh, applied econometrics courses where, where people learn how to uh, uh, estimate the causal effects using various uh, identification strategies. There may be different views on how, uh, how uh, important those things are and whether that's what people should be doing, but there's clearly a lot of demand for that. And I see that not only uh, among the graduate students, uh, I see that at uh, a lot of the tech companies where I've interacted uh, with people uh, where a huge amount of the work they do is essentially uh, uh, trying to estimate causal effects of uh, one uh, type uh, or another. Second part there is there's, a, there's, there's more recently a huge demand for, for uh, catching up with the computer scientists and understanding machine learning uh, techniques. Again, that's not just coming from, uh, from the academic side of uh, things, but it's also uh, in industry, people are going to uh, increasingly work with people from different disciplines uh, and a lot of these methods have been hugely successful and effective uh, and we need to teach the students uh, 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 what they are and how to use them. Um, so tomorrow actually in the, the ADM, this ADM session uh, where there's a paper by Jenna Curry, Cleven and uh, Spears where they they did uh, a text analysis on a bunch of on uh, all MBR working papers and uh, on, a, on papers in, uh, in top five journals, kind of looking for trends in, uh, in techniques. Uh, and I just want to show some of the, the graphs. Uh, so, they, they have, um, so this is directly uh, taken from, from their presentation. They have a lot of other uh, terms they look at. But you see that sort of over the last uh, 20 years, a lot of there's been a lot of changes in what things uh, have become more prominent uh, and other uh, techniques have gone down. Simultaneity has, uh, has gone down. I'm sure if you look at K-class uh, that it's gone down to pretty much zero uh, and, uh, if it ever was, uh, was used uh, very much. Uh. But so part of the question uh, that I now wanna address in the rest of, the, of my five minutes is what, what are the things that are likely to be uh, important uh, in the next 10 years or become uh, more important. Uh, and so again, this is to a large extent speculation. This is, these are things that some of which I'm interested in uh, and people should not, not feel uh, constrained from working on, uh, on other things. Uh, people need to come up with their own things. But so, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes, uh, the, the remaining uh, time, kind of talking about uh, experimental design issues. I'll probably skip some of the decision theoretic uh, uh, issues because the, I completely agree with the, the things uh, Gary and Lars uh, said about that. Uh, um, I'll probably also skip some of the, the robustness and sensitivity analysis. I think 
we, uh, I'll talk a little bit about asymptotic methods and whether we may have overemphasized those in the, in the last uh, few decades uh, relative to their importance in practice. Uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about spatial methods. Uh, I'll talk about uh, directed acyclical graphs. Uh, and, uh, I think they're, they're very important, uh, despite what, what uh, Judea Pro keeps uh, saying, uh, that I think, uh, in fact, I had uh, Pearl give a guest lecture in my, my graduate class uh, a couple of months ago where he kept complaining that uh, the econometrics establishment was banning his methods uh, and that, that we were preventing uh, students from, from uh, studying them. Uh, I think they're very important. I think going to, there's going to be lots of uses for them in uh, economics. They're not going to answer all our questions. Uh, it's not necessarily the, the way all causal questions should be set up, but I think they're very interesting. And uh, machine learning methods uh, that, have, that have in the last couple of years already become very popular in many uh, uh, settings, but I think there's a huge amount of work to be done integrating them into econometrics, uh, making them compatible with the type of uh, economic structure coming from economic theory that we want to use. And so in a lot of cases, we can't use these methods directly. We need to adapt them. We need to find ways of uh, making them work for the questions uh, we're interested in. But sort of first about experimental design. Uh, so the, the traditional uh, experiments uh, are relatively easy to, uh, to analyze, uh, but in, in modern settings, there's very com complicated questions uh, in terms of both the design and the, the analysis of, uh, of experiments. In many of the, the, the modern experiments, there's, there's serious concerns with interference, with spillovers, uh, with violations of, uh, of sattva that make it very hard to design uh, experiments and analyze them. In many of the, the online experimentation, we're really dealing with two-sided markets where there's two sets of agents. We could randomize over one, we could randomize over the other, but there's going to be much richer designs that are going to be much more informative about the equilibrium, uh, the, the implications of the equilibrium concepts, uh, and we can use experiments to shed light on those, but they're going to be much more complex than the type of things uh, we've done so far. There's a lot of work going on on uh, sequential, sequential experimentation. Uh, uh, there's a lot of work going on on using Bayesian methods uh, in experimentation. The, focus, the traditional focus on just testing for statistical significance is really inappropriate for the way these experiments are being used in, uh, in practice. Uh, and uh, you see a lot of the, the tech companies moving to more, towards more Bayesian uh, approaches uh, there. We need to deal, do a much better job accounting for external validity. Again, in many, uh, it's in, in some of the biomedical settings this comes up, but it's not nearly as prevalent as it is in, uh, in economic settings. In many cases, we're interested in long-term outcomes rather than uh, short-term outcomes, but we can't uh, run the experiment for as long as we would like to do. And so there's going to be a lot of interesting, complicated questions there uh, regarding experiments. Uh, I'm pretty much out of time, so uh, let, me, let me just make one comment here. I do think that, that in the last couple of decades, we've, we've overemphasized the, the importance of, of asymptotic properties, kind of, uh, such as consistency as asymptotic normality, and that we, we need to be more flexible in terms of looking at the properties of procedures that are uh, uh, developed. In the end, what is important is whether they lead to good decision rules, to whether they, they're helpful for decision makers in reaching their decisions, rather than in, in particular the kind of narrowly defined uh, properties. Okay, so let me stop here before. Uh, so, um, the next speaker is Rosa Maskin.
Thank you to the organizers for including me in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, so I'm, um, I thought we were given the title challenges and opportunities. So I thought that before starting to discuss a vision for econometrics uh, for the next following years, uh, we look at some of the main issues that econometrics has been concerned with. So the if uh, one thinks about the variable a vector of observable variables y that they were interested on, consumption, employment, and so on, x is a vector of observable explanatory variables, then in the ideal situation, we know the distribution of uh, y given x, okay, for, some for the values of x that are in observed, basically in the support of x. Now, uh, we are um, trying to explain from how this relationship occurs, so basically we have, you know, we're thinking about models, which I call M, which uh, relate X and some unobservable variables to this Y, okay? So think about like this box where X can see, epsilon is a vector of unobservable variables can see, they are inputs, the output is Y, so we have this box, and within this box, there is this model M, which we do not know. So the questions we, econometrics and economics has been interested on is say basically what can we learn about this model M, about the mechanism that generated Y from X and some other unobservable variables. Um, what can we learn about them from this distribution? Okay, so can we recover M? Can we recover sets, you know, some elements of M? Uh, what happens then if we know, if we knew M or some elements of it, maybe we can say something about the values uh, of some elements of M for values of X that have not been observed. And we also need to worry about the cases where X uh, is not exogenous, it's not something we can control, but it uh, uh, depends on unobservable variables. So we would want to know if, we, if the question of interest is what will happen with the values of Y when we move X, then we need to, concern, to be concerned with more complicated models. Then also we can test properties of elements or the model M that, I mean, are there uh, shape restrictions on the distribution of Y given X that are generated uh, from particular um, shapes of M. And the, the other question is the counterfactual. So if we want to see, let's say, if we're going to impose some new policy that will generate a different mechanism, uh, which is this M tilde, then what can we learn about that distribution from knowing uh, M, basically? Okay, so, so those were some of the questions of interest that they were studied in, like, you know, when econometrics started, let's say if, if you go back to the uh, reports of the Coast Commission in 1932, then they basically, they started with the motto was science and measurement, is, uh, sorry, science is measurement, and then uh, after a while they, they um, decided that they needed theories to give guidance about models, and then the motto change to theory is measurement. So, um, okay, so what do we, so if those are the issues we're concerned with, then what, the, what happens now? Well, we are like in a really very nice situation. First, uh, we have an amazing amount of data. So as Ingus was saying, in the beginning, we had like, you know, 50 observations was ideal. Now we can observe the whole distribution. So we have large data sets, many of them in the large quantity. We have very high dimensions for Y, for X explanatory variables, and for any other variables we might, that might help us to study this model M. Uh, we also have many different types of data. We have uh, data that is in text form, and there has been lots of uh, very interesting studies using that, but there is also a voice, there is video that we might want to incorporate into our uh, methods. Computers are faster than ever, much more powerful, huge storage capacity, so it's kind of like an ideal world. There is also a huge uh, demand for empirical analysis in all fields and disciplines. So we basically what our skills are, are you know, can be very uh, useful for other uh, fields and disciplines. And the, then statistics, computer science is uh, developing uh, many very interesting um, techniques which we can use. So basically it's like a, this is a very nice uh, period to be an econometrician. 
So what are the opportunities, just to be specific? So, well, first, the complexity of models uh, doesn't need to be as restricted as in the past because now we have the data size is, uh, is much larger and also we have we don't have computational limitations as compared with the past. So like for example, linear models with additive random terms, which are like a few variables, and that's kind of like a knife edge um, model where you just, if you just modify a little bit the linearity to some non-linearity, then the conclusions may be very different. Then we don't need to do that. I mean, there was a justification for that in, for that in the past, but not now. Then, the high dimension of X of the explanatory variables allows us to consider high dimensional unobservables. And these are very important, so we might consider now models where unobservable variables enter in nonlinear ways um, and in large dimensions too. And these are important variables because first they might represent things that are important like uh, taste, productivity, ability, that we don't have good measurement for them, but the model, the structure of the model, if we can recover them from the model, then we can basically uh, recover them and use them as uh, variables that we observe. And they also, of course, you know, if we don't include them, then the, basically the conclusions of the, of the estimations might be biased too, so. Okay, and then, um, Simultaneity, <laughs> so, widow doesn't teach it, but I, I do. <laughs> so I, so um, I, I think it's very important. So I mean, there is now um, network models are an example of a very complex model that uh, where simultaneity is, is key, basically. We do want to study the relationship, who is affecting the decisions of who else, I mean, who are friends with who, how people choose friends. Uh, so what are the networks? People now are choosing basically the networks from the, yeah. so, uh, so, uh, so we do want, so if we have a huge model with all the Ys are just simultaneously determined, um, then we can basically see what are the network. We can identify the network using these new methods, basically. Um, then uh, another opportunity, I think that we should be looking into different econometric techniques. I mean, we're very used to getting the data in the basically, you know, in a, in a, a spreadsheet, and the, now we have all these other types of data. So how do we measure things like, you know, the floor was wet, and how that influenced some action of someone? So, um, so we might want to, so computer scientists are considering these things, like Judea Pearl, for example, that was mentioned before, uh, has this, is considering this type of models, and that's, uh, we should be paying more attention to that, I think. Um, but improving them. Uh, and then um, also testing models. We can, I mean, it's as uh, uh, Lars was saying, I mean, models are, are really, you know, uh, we, should, we should try to estimate these models, to try to see what model works, what model doesn't, and not just take it basically as given. So testing methods for um, models could be very important. How we might So what are the challenges? I'm not sure if these are challenges or more opportunities, but then I kind of like divided the presentation into uh, how other fields, techniques from other fields can help econometrics, and then how econometrics can help other fields. So, uh, so I think uh, that we should promote, promote more uh, the techniques we have developed. The uh, things like instrumental variables, endogeneity, have not been uh, used that much in other fields and disciplines, uh, like psychology, sociology, now there is a huge demand for methods because they have the availability of data. So the, our skills and experience will be useful for other fields. Um, then, um, this, uh, we have also, we have used uh, also restrictions. So let's say when one looks at the methods of machine learning and so on, uh, it's like the data is given, and let's try to see what the data says, but we have, uh, we know more about, basically we have restrictions on the variables that can, like weak separability, monotonicity, concavity, are uh, uh, properties that we might want to, to use in the models, and not just we, but they might find that useful too. Uh, so uh, also, I think the issue of uh, 
uh, data availability raises a single thing, a lot of questions that we, as economists we should be concerned with and as econometricians we might help. Uh, so there are these privacy uh, situations. Now people don't really know. I mean, if we, can, if we know that we can identify things and if people know that that's what we can identify, they might be worried. So we should basically enter into a discussion of what's uh, basically in general market for data, What's the price? Are people, uh, basically, is the price that exists now the optimal price? Are people being discriminated um, uh, because of the information that companies have about them, and so on. So, and also, uh, artificial intelligence, I think, it's kind of like the closest to what, what we would think of uh, concerns that uh, we have been studying. Like, I mean, they try to learn, a machine is trying to learn about the world and try to provide some advice uh, or some action. So like Judy Apert talks about identifying the, uh, the effect of causes and then the causes of effects, right? So, so basically, how, uh, what are the, what's the reason why we're seeing something? Uh, so their models are still, I think they don't have uh, as much sophistication as, as the methods that we use in econometrics, like uh, you know, simultaneity is, is difficult to deal with those uh, uh, graphs but, and their methods, but so again, we have a possibility of contributing to, to those fields, but it would be important to, to basically provide advice on how to basically people can make better decisions and uh, get better information. So in summary, so econometrics, you know, we're in a great situation. Uh, we're much less constrained in terms of what we can do. Uh, we can, there are lots of methods that are being developed that would be very useful for us. And also we should contribute to the other fields and disciplines. The next speaker is Dan McFadden. Since its inception, uh, econometrics has been hemmed in by computational limits, which have constrained the ability to collect, manage, and analyze data. However, in recent decades, we have seen an explosion in computational capacity that prom promises to continue. This offers new opportunities and challenges for the field. Uh, to provide some context for the remarks that I'm going to make, I'll quickly review how computation has shaped econometrics. The subject uh, existed in concept and name from the beginning of the 20th century, but the first empirical study that was used economic theory was done by Ragnar Frisch in his 1924 study of the demand for sugar in Paris. Working with 20 months of data, Frisch produced least squares estimates from re regression of log quantity on log price and log income uh, depleted. Uh, the computations were done on what was then a relatively new invention, the Burroughs adding machine, by first computing X prime X and X prime Y, and then using Gauss-Jordan elimination to solve for the linear system, X prime XB equals X prime Y. In this case, with two explanatory variables, 20 observations, and careful checking, this would have been the work of a few hours. Uh, in my first econometrics course in 1959, this, a few weeks was still spent on using the Burroughs adding machine method for doing uh, linear regression. Uh, at that time, university computers were being introduced, but they lived in basements and ate punch cards. There was no regression software. Uh, at the request of John Shipman, I actually wrote a rudimentary least squares uh, program in assembly code, code, but due to lack of memory and uh, data input problems, it was never, never very useful. The introduction of Fortran in a machine independent version around 1963 and establishment of campus computer centers allowed development of practical software, such as Bob Hall's TSP package and the SAS system. My multinomial logit model for analysis of discrete decisions and software for maximum likelihood estimation of this model began in 1965 as uh, computers progressed and estimation using nonlinear methods became possible. 
When I started the travel demand forecasting project at Berkeley in 1972, I had to buy a mini computer and hire a software engineer and a hardware engineer to manage and process the data uh, we collected. A decade later, Sun workstations and IBM PCs became available, and soon these machines had sufficient capacity to handle in a few minutes or hours the jobs that earlier had taken overnight uh, at the computer center. Input, output, and data storage improved in spreadsheets and commercial software packages such as Stata were introduced that simplified data management and estimation tasks. In the following decades, we've seen amazing increases in machine speed, memory, database management, distributed and parallel processing. Today, my watch has about the same capacity as the first CDC supercomputer in 1960. Econometrics has followed a pace. In my research area of dis discrete choice, the idea of using sim simulation methods and estimation and of estimating mixed logit models using hierarchical Bayes methods blossomed as tools when computation made them feasible. More broadly, we're now seeing inter increasing use of large panel data sets, non-parametric methods, and increasing use of experimental uh, data facilitated by computation. Uh, as computation has advanced, econometrics has stripped away a lot of the untidy veil between economic theory and empirical analysis that computational limits imposed on early econometrics. However, to keep econometrics vigorous and relevant and keep up with the changing balance between model complexity and statistical precision, I think it is necessary to continue to move aggressively to embrace the innovations in data collection and analysis created by computational advances. Uh, consider first the use of big data and machine learning tools for its management and analysis. Data sources such as scanner data and tracking data from search engines and internet retailers provide vast quantities of real-time information. However, the landscape of big data, while vast, is often a desert that lacks information on critical variables and history that informs the morphology of causation. Simple, almost autonomous computations such as lasso regression provide short-term forecasts that in many cases outperform econometrics done in a traditional batch process manner emphasizing statistical properties. However, computer scientists working on artificial intelligence and machine learning are also pushing their methods into policy applications where lack of structural content and statistical sophistication will cause severe problems. Uh, terms like artificial neural networks, ensemble decision making, random forests sound exotic and they actually have a reasonable statistical pedigree, but in practice they are little more than nested logit models and mixtures of these models developed decades ago, updated, uh, and that's not, not just trivial updating, substantially updated to use real-time uh, uh, data updating Bayesian methods and model selection criteria. One uh, feature of big data is it's rarely big enough or complete enough. Uh, for example, in my work in health econometrics, uh, I work with the Medicare claims data. That's more than 3,000 variables on 55 million subjects followed monthly for 20 years if they last uh, the whole period. Certainly big compared to most econometric data sets, but with no direct information on socioeconomic status, health status at the time of enrollment, or clinical measures such as blood pressure and BMI. So it's, it's vast, but it's not necessarily deep. One of the questions that we uh, uh, raise, uh, typical I think, is how, do, uh, how does drug regimen affect the progress of chronic diseases and what regimens are uh, efficacious and cost effective? Uh, we track 28 chronic health conditions. That means there are two to the 28, there's something over 100 million chronic disease states. And if you think of uh, trying to estimate a monthly first order transition matrix, that has uh, over 10 to the 16th cells. 
even uh, in, in our data over the 20 year period, we observe approximately 10 to the 10th uh, transitions from one monthly chronic disease state to another. That means that in that table, only about one in a million cells uh, ha is populated. I don't think there is any realistic prospect that a purely data-driven estimate of that transition matrix using Bayesian methods or whatever could can replace our knowledge of the etiology of chronic diseases gained from medicine and biology. Computers are not a substitute for science. On the other hand, big data and machine learning have the potential to be major aids to science. For example, supervised learning by machines that are instructed to give high weight to definitive medical experiments, biological experiments in clinical histories may be able to produce a realistic transition matrices for chronic diseases that reveal interactions not previously detected. However successful supervised learning, however, Successful supervised learning requires a carefully designed program of instruction. The underreported story on machine learning is it involves careful tuning, and there are many failures on the way to success. This is manageable for clearly structured tasks such as playing Go, but less clearly so for more ambiguous tasks like determining the, determining the efficacy of alternative treatments for chronic disease. How can machines be taught to learn about scientific content? Uh, the answer is that we already have a successful model, the training of human st students to become scientists. The, con the content of the field is critically curated and presented, first simply, then more elaborately, with exercises in deduction and induction to test whether it's understood. Important definitive concepts and experiments are given particular prominence. Here is where uh, experimental techniques like randomized clinical trials and social and behavioral experiments uh, come in. For example, uh, these have high value in establishing the causal morpho morphology of the science and deserve prominence. However, they do not stand alone and in particular are not alternatives to more general epidemiological style studies, but rather complements to these studies. Uh, for example, uh, a, a randomized uh, clinical trial is designed to uh, be independent of, uh, of interactions uh, and uh, uh, unintended causation, but the, the other downside of that is that you cannot learn anything from an RCT about the impact of those interactions. So you need to embed the RCT in a, in a broader uh, framework uh, in which those interactions can be detected. And, and that, that uh, transition matrix I just described for the uh, progress of chronic diseases, uh, particularly when it's broken down by uh, drug regimen, is, is precisely, but at, at extreme end, the kind of uh, complement you need to uh, RCTs to have the whole enterprise work uh, effectively. I think it is important for the future econometricians to appreciate and understand this complementarity and to, re and to balance the received content of economic theory with current criticisms and findings. Neither in uncritical acceptance or blanket rejection are a good science. What are the lessons here for uh, econometrics? Uh, first, I think you should simply, you should not simply dismiss machine learning and their computer uh, masters as deplorables. Uh, you should instead, instead think of them as your worst students. Ignorant, <laughs> arrogant, disinterested. But if you can break through and get them to understand that there is value in the scientific content of the field of economics, they also have the potential to become your most valuable research assistants and research <laughs> associates. Thank you. The last speaker is Chris Sims.
next title is, I think this is what was in Serena's first email to us about what this panel uh, was going to be about. So I left the, uh, the more exciting and, <coughs> and perhaps less responsible title, The Future of Econometrics. <coughs> Being last, I get a chance to talk about a little bit about my, the previous speakers. <coughs> um, and uh, <coughs> uh, I have two comments. Uh, on that, uh, yeah, uh, but I just want to um, disagree with Deaton's claim that he's not an econometrician, <laughs> <laughs> um, and point to the fact that that I think we are a little behind our our neighbor discipline statistics in the extent to which um, people who label themselves econometricians have really serious credentials in an applied field. It's now almost universal in statistics departments that, that tenured, tenured or tenure track statisticians uh, have a major side of their scholarly work being a deep substantive understanding of some area and they collaborate with uh, applied workers in other areas. I think we ought to be um, in our hiring and teaching decisions as assuming that, that um, a really good econometrician has some real substantive uh, expertise and is doing applied work as well as pure theory. Um, also, Hansen pulls out this measurement without theory thing that we hear over and over again. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's true uh, that uh, measurement without theory is empty and, uh, and somebody who claims to let the data speak entirely by themselves is dangerous. But as dangerous is the opposite, a theorist who claims that he can uh, arrive at conclusions without careful uh, consideration of data or has the illusion that he is able to do that. Um, so uh, I just want to, to emphasize that, there is, that this is one of those deep truths where where it is true, but its contradiction is also true. <laughs> so, um, so Mike's my perspective is uh, that I think of the aim of inference is to provide probability distributions over unobserved decision relevant objects, conditional on observed data, or else to provide characterizations of likelihood functions that can be used by readers to formulate such probability distributions. This is another way of saying I'm a Bayesian. Um, uh, we don't make this perspective the central one as we teach econometrics in most places yet, um, but it is what decision makers expect of us, and they routinely treat our pre-sample probability statements as if they characterize post-sample uncertainty. So I think we should be making this the, we ought to teach this approach to inference first and frequentist stuff as an appendix rather than the reverse, which is wh the way it's usually done uh, now. So in what follows, I'm gonna comment on some recent trends in econometrics and adjacent disciplines arising from the same issues of increased po computational power and bigger data sets that others in this group, in this panel have talked about. Uh, from this perspective. Um, I can't talk about every subtopic that I'd like to, and I'll probably have to skip some of the slides as we go through. Um, so one trend is mostly harmless econometrics. Um, I, this, is a, this is an unfair characterization, but I don't have much time, so it's better to be unfair and provocative than take two slides and do it carefully. Um, <laughs> one way to use increased n, increased sample size, is to grant ourselves some relief from guilt about using distribution theory that's valid as n goes to infinity in our actual finite samples. It's true that bigger n's are indeed closer to infinity, but to gain this relief from guilt, we have to restrain ourselves from let letting model complexity and parameter count grow with n. And in fact, they do. Uh, as uh, Dan was just showing us, uh, you get your bigger computers, you get your big data set, and you suddenly realize that you have even more empty cells in your model than you had before you had a bigger computer. Um, our ambition continues to, uh, to outrun our, 
our, our modeling ambition can c continue to outrun our sample size. Uh, we, in order to keep to to uh, keep the asymptotic distribution theory extremely accurate, we have to stick with single equations, OLS and IV, and uh, then uh, the large end, uh, and then accompany our estimation with uh, the uncertainty measures based on sandwich uh, uh, co on covariance matrices. Uh, but in doing this, the discussion, we tend to push aside discussion of a model that would tell us that OLS captures something interesting or useful about the joint distribution of, of Y and X, or that explains how the instruments are determined and thus plausibly usable as instruments. Uh, that's left in the background, or at best treated informally. These approaches are often seen as requiring, quote, fewer assumptions than approaches that make a probability model of the data explicit, but in fact they just make equally strong assumptions implicitly rather than explicitly. Um, another trend, the imported language from criti clinical trials. When we're considering the effects on a single variable Y with values of zero or one, or another, and, and another um, single variable T that also takes on values zero and one, it is really helpful to realize that if for an observation I, we see only YI of zero or YI of one, usually not both, so that to estimate the difference the expected difference between yi of 1 and yi of 0, we need assumptions about the joint distribution of the observed and unobservable values of y. That's the basic Rubens insight. Uh, but because the distribution of yi here is characterized by a single parameter, we can think of the effects of t on y as changing its expectations or its entire distribution. They're the same thing. Um, but this way of thinking about how to model and interpret causal effects is, in my view, for the most part, awkward and redundant when it is applied to continuously distributed or multivariate uh, T and Y. Uh, a continuously distributed T can have linear or nonlinear effects on Y. It can affect the expectation of Y, but also its dispersion or skewness. There's no one-dimensional measure of causal effect. <coughs> The empirical literature is well into exploring these higher dimensional notions of causal effect via hierarchical Bayes models of random coefficients, nonlinear regression models, models with non Gaussian errors, multiple equation models, et cetera. The language of effects of treatment on the treated, local average treatment effects, et cetera, doesn't seem to me to clarify thinking in these contexts. <clears throat> Modeling without interest, in, this slide is basically about calibrated models, which Lars already discussed, and I don't really uh, disagree with him on that. Um, <coughs> deep neural networks. Um, this is a different way to apply computing power and big data to a complex model without paying much attention to inference. <coughs> its success depends on part on associated methods of approximate optimization, stochastic gradient methods. If you look at, um, at uh, guides to applied work on, on deep neural networks. They're full of rules of thumb to decide on when you've got close enough to convergence in some sense. They, there are theorems that show that stochastic gradient methods uh, converge, uh, at least with high probability. Uh, but when you look at the rules of thumb that are proposed, they violate the conditions of the theorems that say when stochastic gradient measure, me measures uh, methods work, um, it, and this is, this, this is okay in, because the areas where these uh, methods earned their great success are areas where there was a standard of success, which was do as well as people at recognizing images or voices, um, and there are other similar area, areas of categorization where uh, uh, medical diagnostics and so on, where there's a standard of very good performance, which is how people do it. You would like to get a machine to do it. Other methods can't do it. Deep ne neural networks can recognize dogs versus cats as well as people. Uh, and once you've reached that, you don't have to prove that you've already got to the full optimiz fully optimized version of the deep neural network. You've got the deep neural network working well. In economic forecasting, which I think is the main 
area where these uh, methods are likely to be uh, useful to us. We don't have that setup. It's not true that we have people doing a lot better than any of our traditional economi economic forecasting uh, methods so that we could hope that we could get a machine to do as well as people. Uh, they, here, we're really going to have trouble the way we do in all comparison of economic forecasting models um, with uh, the fact that most methods are have very similar uh, 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 forecasting ability, and it's hard to get a clear case that one method is better than another. <coughs> uh, though it would be nice if, if uh, somebody could prove me wrong about this. Uh, I, I think that it, it's not likely that there will be a dramatic success for deep neural networks uh, in, with economic data that, are com that is comparable to what, um, what they achieved in uh, image and voice recognition. <laughs> so let me close with describing what I see as ideal practice, what I try to do when I do empirical work. Uh, I think of myself as working in an infinite dimensional parameter space. Um, and in this infinite dimensional parameter space, one way to define a prior whose support is the whole space is to put weights on distributions on a nested sequence of finite dimensional subspaces. In other words, a nested sequence of, of, of models with finite number of, of parameters. A prior like that will imply that, a given, that in a given finite sample, probability will concentrate on a finite, and in practice it usually turns out to be small, set of finite parameter models with weights, posterior probability weights on the models determined by a trade-off between fit and dimensionality of the parameter space. I like this framework in part because it prescribes behavior that is close to what the best applied researchers actually do. <coughs> Specify a finite parameter model, estimate it, check it by comparing its fit to more complicated models that nest it, and use the more complicated model if that seems justified. <coughs> so why did the previous slide have a question mark after the title. Um, uh, because uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that, that understanding and formally drawing on Bayesian non-parametric theory um, requires understanding measure theory, and it may not be practical to expect applications to be explicitly grounded in such theory. Um, and the framework doesn't in itself recognize computational li limits. Here's a common situation that actually describes my last big applied paper. Um, the, um, we estimate a model that's interpretable, explains much of observed variations, very, has interesting economic interpretations. Then we find that a more elaborate model put, that starts to push against comp computational limits, we start to have to wait overnight to get the MCMC to converge. Um, but it does notify fit notably better by posterior odds. We estimate and interpret the more elaborate model, but then find with informal checks. In this case, we estimated a big vector autoregression, realized we needed t-distributed errors, went through estimating it with t-distributed errors, huge increase in likelihood, and we look at the residuals from the new model. There's still too many big ones but we sent it off to the journal anyway. <laughs> so, um, and why did we do that? Um, we did it in part because it wasn't clear how we could in practice do better than what we had, had done without starting to take a month for each uh, estimation. And also reflects the fact we thought we, what we had was already very interesting. It was giving us really useful, interpretable results we could see that there was a, there's probably out there a model that fits better. We doubted that it would change our conclusions very much. What we, we need, it's a frontier uh, uh, for us, that, um, that we need a way to think about models that we know could be beat, but, but to beat them in fit, we would have to start using a model that was too, either too hard computationally to estimate in a, in a reasonable time, or that would be too hard to interpret and explain in a way that makes it useful to decision makers. 
We don't really have a language to talk about such models, how we decide which is better of, a of models like that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, so now I'd like to give uh, each speaker up to three minutes to, um, to make comments on uh, what we just heard or further elaborate on um, uh, what, what they have, um, what they have um, spoken. So, uh, Gary, Gary, do you want to start with <laughs> Why don't I start with the dog? Yeah. Uh, both, both no, no. <laughs> we, we don't need them. We don't really need them. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> There's one person standing here. Yeah. Um, so, so there's two things I want to comment on. The, um, first, let me start with, with uh, Chris's comments at, at the end. He said that, that so he, he put up a statement that in the end that he, uh, he thinks deep neural nets uh, will not provide a clear improvement over existing methods uh, of economic forecasting. Uh, so my, my guess is uh, that they will. Uh, so I, I think you know, if we meet again here in uh, five years or, or 10 years, I think neural nets will, will be much more common uh, for uh, doing economic forecasting, uh, and they will have greatly improved uh, a lot of the forecast. And the second thing, I'm going to come back to some of the things uh, uh, Angus Deaton uh, raised, and so so he was partly uh, less happy with the, the increased use of uh, of terms like causality. Uh, I think in the end, in almost all the, in most of the work we do, not in all the the work we do as econometricians, we're trying to get a causal effects. If we're trying to actually help decision makers, uh, we we trying to provide them with scenario with. with distributions of outcomes or expected outcomes if they do one thing relative to what uh, would happen if they do something else. We're interested in causal effects. And there, even though we may not all agree on the definitions, uh, it's sort of clear what a, that a working definition is something that the uh, causal effect is tied to an intervention. And those are the things we're interested in and that works for, for most of the problems uh, we are looking at. And so I think there, in the last 30 years, there's been a huge amount of, uh, of progress, uh, yeah, and it's, it's sort of partly from uh, people collaborating with other fields, uh, with, with statistics. Uh, now the computer scientists have gotten very interested in, uh, in causality, and they're doing different things there. Per, as I mentioned before, Pearl's work is, uh, is very interesting there. There's, there's very interesting stuff going on on uh, what they call causal discovery, where they essentially take relatively unstructured data and try to come up with, uh, with causal structures. It's not really clear whether that's going to be directly helpful, uh, but so far it's been uh, very interesting to see what, what people from other fields uh, are going to do there. And I, I think it's very helpful there to be very explicit about uh, the fact that what we're interested in uh, are causal effects. And uh, my guess is that that's, that's one of the things that's going to stay uh, relative to what we're doing at the moment. Does this work? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think this has been interesting. Uh, I was going to say I didn't have anything else to say, but actually I find that I, I do a little bit. I'm glad to be admitted into the club of econometricians. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I will ask Chris to sign a certificate and put it on my office wall um, when people challenge um, my status. Um, I agree with Guido about a lot more things than I thought I might, um, which is um, I really do think that addressing causality and confronting causality instead of avoiding causality, which is what we did for most of my career, 
is a really good idea. And it's true that we are very interested in causal mechanisms and in understanding the world, and that's all about causality. Um, but, you know, labeling something a causal estimate, which means I did an I have an instrument, or I did an RCT, or I did an RD design, um, sweeps a lot of very difficult issues under the carpet, which I think we evade at our peril. Um, I think that's perhaps a good thing, and I do think this opening up this causal box and thinking about it pretty seriously is important. But there are these pitfalls there. Um, I think we valorize causality in a way when we usually mean something else. So for instance, in a lot of the development literature, it's clear that people think a causal estimate is externally valid because it's causal, and that's just a confusion. Um, even causality itself um, often is contingent on lots of other things, as in Ines causality. And so we're not always designing experiments in a way that would reveal what those contingencies are in a way that would actually help us um, to replicate. Um, the other thing is that, as my friend Nancy Cartwright likes to push for, um, causality, the, the mechanisms of causality can be quite different in different places. So if you like, the way the machine is rigged um, could be quite different in different places. So it's not just some um, contingent factor or some helping factor, some excluded variable or interaction variable that's reset differently somewhere else, but the whole structure of the model can be different. So in fact, even the direction of causality can be different in different places. So discovering causality is a very important thing, but we don't want to valorize it to the point where we think that we've done much more than we've done. Um, we've done something important, um, but it's not. One, one of the statements that bothered me most that I read recently was someone saying, well, we don't have to bother about human subjects very much because discovering causality is so important it doesn't really matter if we hurt people in doing it. Well, you need a very sharp idea of what you're doing before you make <laughs> statements like that. Um, because, you know, when you come in front of St. Peter and you're asked, <laughs> what did you do in life? Um, and you said, I did experiments on people without permission, but I discovered causality. And then St. Peter would want a precise definition of causality. And I think you'd be in some trouble um, at that point. Um, I like to... Um, I like very much the, the decision theory framework that came up in across a lot of different presentations. Um, I like that very much. Um, you know, a long time ago, um, Savage argued that if you really were a Bayesian, you shouldn't randomize. Um, and that's simply because you should do an experiment for sure, but you should use the experiment that teaches, that is, gonna te that is designed in a way to teach you the most about what you need to know. Right. Now, the, one of the questions that we're not really addressing is why is that not true? I mean, there was a literature 30 years ago which discussed why that was not true. And there clearly are things you can do with randomization that puts a probability structure um, on your problem in a way that enables you to talk about standard errors and things in a familiar um, way. There's a very nice example that Soup has had of saying, well, you know, if you, you give me a big urn full of balls, um, and you know, I'm told there are 30 white balls and 10 black balls in that urn, and I'm allowed to pull out five balls. And I have to guess, based on that five balls, um, whether it's the 30 and 10 or the 10 and 30, he said the first thing I would ask to do is to shuffle the balls, all right? And I think that is a very useful way of thinking about what you're doing when you randomize. But you know, when our students come to us and say, should I do a randomized controlled trial or should I look at this in some other way? I don't think right now we have a very good answer for them because the standard answer now seems to be, if it's possible to randomize, you should go and randomize. And that's wrong. Um, so, thank you. So I guess I'd like to make two points. One is, uh, this is with great hesitation, I'm gonna take Chris Sims's bait and so I will. Uh, follow up on the Hansen critique. Um, 
apparently I misconveyed the point I was trying to make. Uh, yes, indeed, these are, uh, get, get, um, I was laying out a bunch of references to point out the fact that these discussions about how do you, you know, how much structure to use and how much, to, and, and this trade offs between more empirical approaches and structural approaches, is, is, it's just been an ongoing discussion for many, many decades and over a century now. And, and, it, and, and, and the task of this session was to bring it, you know, is, is, is to talk about stuff like data sciences and new data and machine learning and the like. And I just, uh, uh, and the main point I want to make here was not that, that, that uh, this is some new, that, that this is um, s some insight that's been resolved, but rather there is an opportunity here for econometricians to think very creatively about how to use these methods and, uh, uh, and, uh, and combine them with structure. So I, so I felt a little bit my comment was slightly lifted about a context there, but let me clarify very clearly what the context was meant to be. I certainly agree that for there, there, there's this counter argument that, that the context of I don't want to do straight theory and not use evidence, of course. I don't want to throw away evidence in the end. I, that be, that's just be, that's, there's no reason to go along those lines. The other point that I wanted to make um, is the, the contrast between kind of dynamics and more kind of micro, uh, micro individual analyses here. When we're building these dynamic equilibrium models, um, Data richness helps to, to, uh, to you know, I mean, certainly a relevant issue, but you know, magically becoming non-parametric on a lot of dimensions is still remaining pretty much hopeless, both from the standpoint of interpretation, solution, and even characterizing the uh, of the models which you want to analyze. And so I think, and and a lot of the very important policy questions that we have to address have fundamentally fundamentally dynamic components to them. And I think that. That also raises very interesting challenges because here's you know, you know the whole issue of expectations like that comes back in and becomes central and and this is certainly a place I think that thinking harder about whether there's valuable statistical inputs can be uh, uh, really quite fruitful. Um, I want to add a little bit to what Angus said about randomization. Um, I think a good way to think about um, when you should or shouldn't randomize is to say that you should never randomize if you're doing it because otherwise you're not sure how you would put standard errors on your results. Um, when the, the right principle is to the extent you have uh, good ways to think about stratifying, stratify, don't randomize. And then when you it, it, with the residual, once you've run out, run out of good strata, then you can randomize within the strata. If you want a, a nice, amusing um, little uh, um, fable about why you shouldn't randomize to generate uh, standard errors, uh, look up Basu's Elephants on the internet. It's a classic uh, reductio ad absurdum of the idea of randomizing to generate uh, standard errors. <coughs> uh, I have, uh, first of all, I'd like to make, make a comment on one of uh, Chris Sims' slides. He suggested that as we get more data, we don't necessarily want to build more complex models. Uh, but what we, what we know is that our models are never exact representations of reality, they're approximations. So you're always balancing the ability to estimate a given model with some statistical precision and the approximation errors in that model. As we get big data, perhaps the single most serious problem big data analysts face is overfitting. Uh, and uh, so there needs to be a balance. but. Uh, uh, we, we already know from non-parametric statistics a lot about how model complexity could uh, increase with sample size without having things go bad, and, you know, something on the order of square root of sample size. And uh, we should think about taking that over to the machine uh, learning context and also try to deal with their, their issues of overfitting. Uh, the second comment is, is uh, relative to this issue of causality and what uh, Angus just said about causality. Uh, how do we really use causality? We don't, what, what we really use are empirical laws uh, of invariance or uh, 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 
regular regularization so we can predict what will happen if, some, if there's some policy change. That's, that's the content of causality uh, that matters for us. And so there is an impossible question, which is, 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 a, is there a causal link somewhere or not, which, are, which I think fortunately also t tends to be an irrelevant question. Uh, it's, it's not, we don't need to know, uh, it, uh, and we can't know whether there is a universal causal link that, that might be broken somewhere in the far uh, uh, dark corners of the universe. Uh, but what we, what we can test and know is whether empirical laws of invariance and regularity uh, hold over, over some uh, relevant range. So don't think of causality, I think, as a zero one question. It's, it's a question of the, whether you can bound the size of what uh, the empirical law might, might be, up, on up and downside, and what its uh, implications for policy are. So I just uh, wanted to give a, uh, make a comment on uh, Chris Sims uh, saying about the, uh, what econometricians should be doing, like statisticians, and I think uh, I agree that uh, econometrics by itself, just theoretical, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't seem to have much uh, value uh, unless uh, it has a goal of what, what do we want to, you know, what's the big problem for economics that econometrics is trying to solve. So, um, so connecting with the applied economics uh, that have a particular uh, problem in mind and, and dealing with all the issues like model uncertainty that was discussed and how people make decisions and so on seems extremely uh, important. But, uh, but in general, I mean, I think econometrics as a field it will be isolated from the rest of the profession unless it's uh, connected and it has a goal, like why are we doing this, uh, basically? Why do we want to get these uh, uh, different techniques and uh, what are we getting from it and what do we give to, not just economics, but I would say that also the world is becoming uh, very interdisciplinary and I, I really believe that we, we do need to basically um, promote our techniques and our skills to other fields. It's a, so. um, I, I noticed that uh, <coughs> Ito, <coughs> in his uh, courses over the years, <coughs> uh, he dropped panel data. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I see the point that uh, new sources of data, new kinds of data, they can stimulate good research, and I think they did. And looking forward, we expect that to happen. You mentioned spatial data, that's one possibility, but yes, very much, uh, young person looking around, is there, is there some new kind of data that hasn't been exploited? Can, does it suggest research questions? I think that's uh, probably a very good way to go. Uh, the machine, well, computer science, et cetera, uh, I think, from the beginning, econometrics has interacted with applied math, and that's just been very, very fruitful. Convex analysis is useful. Uh, that's going to continue one way or another, and I think, you know, if you wanna, one wants to stay in the field, one wants to, yeah, keep up with relevant applied math. Uh, the causality, uh, don't have much to say. I mean, uh, okay, the Y0, Y1, potential outcomes, that's come up a few times. And yes, and it gets linked to definitions of causality, et cetera. I always just think that, well, you know, the mo most basic part of a decision problem is, well, if I, if I make this choice, there's some distribution of outcomes that uh, I gotta think about. If I make this choice, well, there's some other distribution of outcomes. And one way or another, I'm going to be using them to, to, to make my decision. Uh, I'm not sure that causal language is so key in that process of you know, trying to arrive at a uh, principled, coherent uh, decision that, you can, that, that one can defend. Uh, Chris's Bayesian sieve, uh, very uh, favorably inclined, and uh, the notion that it could build in a way to trade off you know, how big the model should be relative to how big the data is. Yes, that's, that, yes, I think it can. And that's uh, the effort in, in, in thinking about creative 
you could call them prior distributions or whatever, but creative ways of setting that up where this key, this key trade-off, all the regularization, et cetera, is, is built in, I find, I find extremely uh, attractive. Uh, why do we randomize? Uh, well, uh, a colleague, Max Casey, has a, has a paper on, well, basically it starts from a point that uh, Bayesian decision maker would never strictly prefer randomization, might be indifferent, and he goes on from there. I think that's a very nice question. The point that uh, randomization should not be the basis of standard errors, I just so totally agree with, uh, absolutely, that it's so far from my conception of trying to form a, uh, a posterior distribution that uh, I really can't, can't connect with randomization-based inference very well. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions from the floor. If anybody is interested, can you come up? Thank you for the conversations, and I really like it. I'm from China, and I work for Alibaba. Uh, I have three phrases I want to point up. The first one is the boundary of the data. So I have a question, so I ask all the speakers, what do you think is the boundary of the data? How should we collect them and do the deal with the privacy and the data governance? The second phrase I want to point up is, the storage of data, how do we store those data? What kind of data should we pick up to store uh, with those high dimensions and which, wh what type of data do you think is valuable? The third phrase I want to point up is inclusive growth. I think um, for econometrics, uh, what do you think econometrics can be inclusive with statistics or other disciplines? How could we cooperate more? Um, I'm a little bit nervous, but thanks a lot. I, I encourage myself to come to speak, and I am really grateful to all the ideas, especially details. I agree that I don't like A-B test, and I don't like experiments. As a young people, I refuse to those random experiments, and sometimes I did randomly, so I think I speak too much, but thank you all. Yeah. Perhaps we can focus on the last question on the interface between econometric statistics and computer science part of this question. If anybody has additional so comments to make. I, th I think it's increasingly important for the econometricians to, to work with statisticians and computer scientists, and it's going to be increasingly important kind of to be well versed in the, in the language and the techniques uh, they use in order to be able to <coughs> uh, convey to those people the the, the value of the economic ideas uh, that the econometricians are well versed in. Any more questions from the floor? Can I make a quick comment on yes. Dan's point? I, I realize he got the wrong idea of what I was saying about mostly harmless econometrics. I wasn't endorsing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I was criticizing it for, for um, trying to uh, uh, emphasize too heavily making the asymptotic distribution theory work by keeping uh, models simple. I think that we ought to be working at the edge of saturation of our models. That is, our parameters, we ought to be, be using enough parameters so some of them remain uncertain um, given well, the data we have. And th that's sort of partly why a lot of the machine learning methods are, are pushing things and the, the cross-validation and the regularization is trying to build in the ability uh, that you're at the edge of, uh, of what the data can support. Uh. One more question. Uh, hi. Um, so I've been to uh, sessions at the AAA for the last few years or so, and I'm, a, I'm interested in microeconometrics, and I've noticed that differences and differences is used in at least 25%, maybe 50% of microeconometric presentations. Uh, and I wonder if there's any worry of over-reliance on any one particular method. And if you see where you know, this method is going in the future, do you think there's going to be a pushback? Is there going to be 
more structural estimation in the future. I'm just kind of interested in your thoughts. <laughs> I'm sure we can have differences of, of, of views uh, on, on this. And, uh, I th yes, I, th I think simple difference and difference of methods are probably being overused at the moment, but I think this, there's now uh, a lot of interesting econometric work trying to, to build on those methods to modify them, kind of starting with the, the synthetic control stuff uh, from, from Abadi. And there were a bunch of sessions uh, uh, at these meetings, kind of looking at, at new methods in, uh, in that area. So I think, I think there, we shouldn't just dismiss this as saying, well, these methods are being overused. There's, clear in, there's clearly a lot of interest in settings where these methods can be applied, and it, it's our job to make sure that, that we come up with new methods that, that improve on the existing uh, ones uh, if, we, if we think they're, they're not uh, sufficient at the moment. Yeah, I, just one thing. I mean, John Stuart Mill wrote a lot of very famous books a long, long time ago. And he actually wrote a book on inference, which is not much read, and it's not easy to read, um, mostly because it's written in the sort of worst of florid Victorian prose, which is not the usual econometrics thing. But he made the point, he classified um, various methods of making inference, and what he called the method of differences which differences and differences is one example, but so are randomized controlled trials and so are most of what we've talked about here. Um, but that was, he had several others, and one of the other ones that he emphasized a lot, which is not a method of difference at all, is the hypothetical deductive method, which is the way that physicists will claim they go about their business, for instance, and I think is extremely <laughs> useful in economics, but is not, certainly not taught in econometrics courses. Any further comments? Um, not, I think uh, the two hour discussion left us with a lot of um, thoughts, food for thought. Um, thank the panelists, uh, thank everyone for coming. Um, and we'll